Today, we're discussing the power of vision to engage employees, customers, and investors. If you're a B2B leader, you're going to want to tune in. All right, welcome back to one of these podcasts. I'm David Marsh. So I recently had a meeting with a visionary leader, and his forward thinking and enthusiasm for the future of this company resonated with his team, customers, and investors. And that got me thinking about the importance of visionary leadership, you know, the kind that sparks genuine excitement and enthusiasm for a brand. And to me, Steve Jobs personified a visionary, someone who just seemed to bring us technology from the future. And he was able to successfully equate Apple as a visionary brand, introducing new categories like the iPod and the iPhone. Apple's marketing reflected this at the time with Think Different. Before the iPhone, Nokia and BlackBerry dominated the market. And then Apple completely changed the game with the smartphone. Now, Steve Jobs got people excited about Apple and where they were headed which resonated with employees, customers, and investors. And that is where the real magic is. A visionary statement doesn't do that. It takes a visionary leader to look ahead and to see how things could be done better. Another great example of visionary leadership is Tony Fidel and Matt Rogers. Before Nest, the thermostat was an old, boring device that really hadn't changed for decades. And then come two former Apple employees to reimagine and to innovate a device that we didn't even know needed innovating. With the Nest, we could now schedule our thermostat while we're away from home and optimize our energy bill. And it became just a complete category disruptor and has been copied ever since. Now, I've been fortunate enough to have worked with a few manufacturers that were disruptors. And the one thing that I learned is that if you have success, a lot of companies will emulate what you've done. So just look at how many smartphones and smart thermostats are out now. So what makes a visionary? Well, you've likely heard our left brain is our analytical side and our right brain is our creative side. Everybody's a little bit of both, but some lead toward one and some lead toward another. It's sort of like the yin and yang. And you can't have one without the other. You can't just have a bunch of creative people uh, who never get anything of their ideas out. And you can't just have analytical people because there'd be no innovation. So you have to have a balance of both. And there's a natural balance. And again, we're all a little bit of both. However, since the Industrial Revolution, there was a huge focus on process. And the school systems that were developed at the time started focusing on left brain thinking and purged out right brain thinking of children to be very process-oriented, focusing more on science, technology, engineering, and math, and less on art, music, writing, and dance, or any of the other creative outlets. So it's all about Scantron tests and regurgitating information with the 20% going on to college to manage the 80% doing process-focused jobs. And so we've created a society with an, a deficiency in creativity. And for a long time, Highly creative people were relegated to being the classic starving artists, painters, musicians, writers, etc. But in the modern times, marketing has really been the only outlier within the corporate world for a creative work. Marketing is typically dominated by left brain people, numbers, graphs, analytics, with a small group of right brained creatives producing copy, graphics, videos, etc. Together, they help the brand to stand out and to reach their target audience. And one of the reasons why the creator economy has been so huge is become because creative people finally have an outlet for their own. Uh, since companies almost exclusively are run by analytical types, these creative people finally have a way of sharing their own ideas. So in the business world, a visionary leader is someone who values creative people and has the ability to get their ideas implemented with the analytical team. Creative, working together with tandem with analytical, the yang and yang, the balance. Now the challenge is society is in an imbalance where we're heavily focused on process and creatives are undervalued by companies. 
Now, I've always loved technology, and I'm a huge, huge uh, proponent of AI. But And there's no doubt this is going to become a dominant in- new industry for companies like NVIDIA leading the way. However, I do think that there's just a potential to make the creative analytical balance even worse because AI has been laser focused on creative work, creative content like copywriting, video editing, you name it. And if the analytical types see AI as an opportunity to replace creative people, thinking it will do the creative work for them, then we'll have an even greater deficiency in creativity. But scarcity in creativity means creative people will be your one key to standing out in a sea of unimaginative AI-generated content. And I think the creator economy already has proven this. Creative people can really change the game with their out-of-the-box thinking, especially when they're teamed up with analytical counterparts. So I think a visionary is sort of a, a square peg in the round hole out there thinking deeply about how things can be improved and understands there needs to be a balance between creative and analytical to change things because nothing really does change without them. The rest of the world emulates what's already proven until we have factories full of thermostats that haven't been changed for decades. Followers imitate after they see success. Visionaries take risks to move things forward. Now back to Steve Jobs. After he got kicked out of Apple, he started Next Computer in 1985, creating high-end workstations and developing uh, software based on FreeBSD, which would actually later become Mac OS after Apple purchased it in 1997. But what if Apple never purchased Next? Well, Apple would have likely gone out of business, Next would have likely failed, and things like Pixar and all the devices that we use every day might have never been made. And so the challenge for visionaries can be resources because if they have a creative team with great ideas and an analytical team to implement, but without resources, there is no innovation. So once Steve Jobs was back at Apple, he built his vision on Apple's ethos of innovation and its resources. He knew how to assemble a team of both thinkers and doers and knew how to get them to make great work together. And he was able to balance his team and lead them toward his vision. So a visionary needs to be someone who's able to assemble and lead a team of both thinkers and doers and get their visions implemented. But they'll need the capital to make it work. And unlike ideas, and likewise, ideas with, with resources, but lacking vision also fail. And I think You know, I've shared a lot of ideas myself over the years, but really stopped kind of giving it all away. So when they try to implement it without my help, uh, they can't because they don't have the complete vision to make it work. Now, companies with resources and creatives are needed to help to innovate. And a personal story that illustrates this is when I worked for an internet company back in 1995. I'm 27 years old, and I went to go to a local TV station got an appointment with the general manager, which was a big deal. And I get in front of him. He's probably in his mid-50s. And I lay out how the television station can leverage the internet, build a website, share their content online with a growing audience beyond their service area to expand their reach. Taking the station online would allow them to make their video content or their content available on the internet to access their news content on demand. And I laid out how they could do that. How, how we could help them do it, et cetera. His response, we're good, kid. Get the heck out of my office. Four years later, that television station wound up being sold because they couldn't afford to go digital, which was mandated, and got bought by a large conglomerate who immediately took their news online. So a lot of times, managers who lack or block innovation and innovative ideas can actually destroy the future of the business. Because while they have the resources, they might not have the vision. Now, convincing people to change how they're doing things often takes pain or fear of losing what they have. For example, if you're running a service company, you don't have a widget 
You don't have a device that's going to be a, a category disruptor. You don't have anything to show to get people excited about, which is a big piece of you know, getting somebody to visualize their life with this new thing, how it's going to help them, how it's going to make their life better, et cetera. Because services are intangible, they can't be seen, touched, or experienced before purchase. And it really requires the prospect to really buy into someone's vision of doing things differently, which is an order of magnitude harder than selling a tangible item. So visionaries look ahead and they see the problem with staying the course. Because staying the course doesn't always lead to a good destination. Maybe the ship is heading toward the rocks. Uh, But the captain and the crew are saying, we're good. We've been selling this heading for a long time. So the visionary needs to be able to persuade. Let's take the economy right now. If we look at one, maybe two years from now, what do you see? What are CEOs doing to mitigate risk and to maintain business continuity? You look at how many of these companies do massive hirings, which bleed out the job market, and then they do massive firings. What's the long-term impact of doing that over and over and over again? And what's the cost of rehiring and retraining? Now, consider customer acquisition costs. They're already gone through the roof. With some B2B industries looking at 75% increases over the last five years. That's right now. That's not two years from now. So why are companies still allowing their managers to hire the same way they did five and 10 years ago, where they do these big, deep hires and create this bureaucracy that limits accountability. And it also creates a higher cost for every single customer because they have a lot of roles that could have just easily been outsourced. So I've personally been trying to convince corporate leaders to switch to a hybrid model where their direct team are the people they pay the most because finding really good talent and keeping them is a huge deal. In fact, people are actually keeping talent that they probably would like to get rid of, but the cost of rehiring and retraining people is so expensive that they wind up keeping people that they know aren't really cutting it. And I think another big issue is that some in upper management are just more focused on their own career by hiring these large inside sales teams because it's just more impressive to have hired and managed a team of 50 BDRs than to have outsourced a team of 50 BDRs on a resume. And that, that's just why you see so many of these large companies just buckling under the weight. So who cares about your company? Are your managers concerned about company profitability? You know, when bonuses only depend on hitting sales targets, managers are going to become laser focused on those numbers, even if it means ignoring cost-saving opportunities. And that really prioritizes quick wins over long-term growth, leaving your company vulnerable to you know, economic downturns. And managers who are focused on just building these large inside sales teams as a way of demonstrating their influence or capabilities can create just serious waste and balloon customer acquisition costs. So what can you do as a business leader? Well, in addition to sales numbers, Reward customer acquisition cost reduction and operational efficiency. Share the bigger picture with your management team. And lastly, challenge the status quo and reward out-of-the-box thinking. Now, a big piece of the service side for me is getting leadership to change how they hire because the cost of customer acquisition is just going up dramatically. So making the decision now to outsource versus when, you know, while it's a competitive advantage versus when everyone starts doing it is really the key. Now, I'll leave it right there. Uh, you can check out wavereps.com if you want more information on, on sales outsourcing. But one other thing I want to add was, you know, vision isn't always valued. Um, when someone that I've talked to, you know, years ago tells me, man, you were 10 years ahead when you were telling us to do this. But if I wasn't able to persuade them 10 years ago, it really doesn't matter. It's like saying, you know, I should have bought Bitcoin 10 years ago. So it's only changing people's minds from how they're currently doing things to doing it in a better way. Do I have any satisfaction? So Vision Plus 
the ability to persuade is really the key. Now, if you're a creative who has just a bunch of great ideas, but you don't have the resources to get them to, to make them happen, um, you need to take risks and become an entrepreneur. And hopefully you can find a partner to sort of balance out the creative and analytical side. And then, you know, you can only achieve great things by changing the game and not following it. Because established companies are unlikely to implement your vision unless you might find another visionary leader who values creative thinkers. Um, And I do have one last story for you that sort of drives this point home. I know of a, a team that worked for a successful hardware company and they pitched management with a new software solution they had developed to complement the hardware. And it would have been a major win for the company. But they got shot down because management was more concerned about maintaining the status quo and not competing against other software companies they had partnered with. So the team quit, started their own company, and created a wildly successful software product. And the company that turned them down went out of business. So remember, hire the visionaries, create teams of thinkers and doers, take risks, and change things. And there you have it. A deep dive into visionary leadership and some of the key areas for B2B leaders so they can help drive success. Well, thank you for tuning in to today's episode of one of these podcasts. Until next time, stay innovative and stay ahead of the curve.